can definitely hear that. Um, so uh, my name is John. I'm CTO of Stormforge. I work with Rafa from Two Talks to Go. Uh, you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm British, but I live in America now. I live in Washington, DC. And first time in Latin America, delighted to be here. It's been beautiful, it's been amazing. Um, and I'm here to talk about auto-scaling on Kubernetes. So there's two main reasons to auto scale. And well, there's one reason to auto scale. It's to have the right resources at the right time. And there's two ways you can miss on that front. You could have too few resources, in which case you will be unreliable, and that's obviously terrible. And then um, the other way you could miss is you could have too many, and then you barely use any of them, and it will be inefficient, expensive, um, which is still, still better than um, being unreliable, which is why people typically just over-provision everything, and the average efficiency of a Kubernetes cluster is 20%. So there's a variety of different ways to auto-scale on Kubernetes, and it's important to use the right tools for the right, sort of, the right problems. Um, so the first, and the one people typically start with, is horizontal auto-scaling. So that's adding and removing replicas for a workload as the uh, usage changes. Um, and then uh, related to that is, okay, I'm adding and, I'm adding and removing replicas. What's the size of each of those replicas? Because there's no point going up and down with the usage if each of those uh, replicas is only using 20% of its uh, resources, you'll still be massively over-provisioned and very inefficient. And horizontal and vertical auto-scaling, not new to Kubernetes, been around for a long time. People probably use them uh, with auto-scaling groups uh, on EC2. You had to pick uh, what type of VM you wanted to use, what instance type, CPU heavy, memory heavy, and then set up the auto-scaling groups to go up and down. Kubernetes, because what you're planning to do is run a whole bunch of pods on the nodes and share res resources between them, introduces another dimension. Um, and that's cluster auto-scaling. So as you're adding replicas uh, via the HPA, eventually the nodes will run out of space. You need to add new nodes. And that's where the cluster order scaling comes in. And then again, the reverse on the way down, you remove, uh, you remove a whole bunch of replicas, you end up with a fragmented cluster, you want to consolidate that and eliminate a lot of the waste. So that's the sort of general framework. So I'm just going to move this slightly. That's the general framework. And then for each of those dimensions, there's a variety of tools. Um, and the general theme is there was sort of uh, tools built into the, there's been sort of tools uh, for each of these dimensions built into Kubernetes since pretty much the very beginning. And then over the last few years, there's been more advanced tools which come out um, to solve more advanced use cases. Right, so let's start with horizontal auto scaling. And then um, how many people here have used the HPA or done horizontal auto scaling on Kubernetes? Oh, a few. Uh, so how the HPA works, um, is first, it's constantly watching the metric server, which is the monitoring pipeline, which is tracking things like CPU and memory usage and CPU and memory requests for all of the pods, nodes, and the cluster. So it's constantly checking the metric server, and then it will update the replica count for whatever object it's managing. Um, it obviously, it works with all of the built-in types, like stateful sets, deployments. Uh, it works with Argo rollouts. And then if you build your own custom resources, like they were discussing in the previous talk, you can also implement something called the scale sub-resource, and then you can have the HPA manage any of your own custom types. And then it will update the replicas, the replica count, or the, the replicas in the spec for whatever object it's managing, and then that object is actually responsible for rolling out the new pods or removing the new pods. So that's how it works from sort of an implementation point of view. But then the key question is, how does it decide what is the right number of replicas to have? And oh, there's been a few iterations here. So the very first version of the HPA on Kubernetes, um, the only thing you could scale on was CPU utilization. If you wanted to scale on memory or anything else, out of luck. Um, and the way it worked is as shown on the screen. So this is showing. Uh, a pod or a workload with a specific set of requests, showing the usage for each of the pods, each of the replicas in that workload, and then a target utilization. And then the idea is that once you get above the target utilization, you want to add more replicas, share the load with the new replica, utilization should come down and it should just work. Um, and that's how the calculation works. What it does is it takes the current utilization, divides it by the target, and then 
will change the replicas by that amount. So if, you are, if your utilization is two times too much, you will start twice the replicas. And if you share uh, the load evenly, you should come down as seen here so that the average utilization is equal to the target utilization. So makes sense, works very similar to how the auto scaling groups on AWS worked for VMs. Um, however, has a whole bunch of limitations. And the biggest issue is that often CPU utilization is not a good metric to scale on. And what that leads to is replicas either not being added when they're needed, or replicas being removed when they are needed, or just general thrashing. Um, and you can see that here. So this is, um, there's a link at the bottom, and I'll share the slides. Uh, this is from, a, the link is to a KubeCon talk uh, from two, three years ago, uh, from a customer of ours, Arquia, who runs a large hosting platform. And they were scaling their workloads on CPU utilization, and they were having lots of issues with thrashing. So they decided they were gonna migrate, they were gonna scale on a different metric, um, and uh, which was basically the number of requests currently being processed by each replica. Once that hit 50% of the amount a single replica could handle, they would add new replicas. And it doesn't take a genius to guess where they cut over. It's right here at half five. Um, so you can see what happened. It went from being extremely erratic and if you look at the average replica count here, it was very, very expensive to run this. They cut over, you can still see that they scale, um, but it's in a much more controlled fashion. So it's probably five times cheaper and much more reliable because it's not just thrashing constantly. So often scaling on a custom metric is gonna be much, much more effective. And with V2 of the HPA, it went from being one option of CPU utilization to literally every possible option. So you can scale on custom and external metrics. You can scale on multiple metrics. So you could scale on the queue depth if you were running a task queue. And then you could have a second metric with CPU utilization and set the target utilization very high. So if the load on a replica spiked, you would basically have it like a release valve and start a new replica. Uh, you have much more conf uh, sort of ability to configure policies scaling up and down. For example, don't add more than two pods at a time on the way up. Wait for at least five minutes before removing a pod and then wait another five minutes on the way down. Huge amounts of uh, flexibility, as, with of as is often the case with Kubernetes. Um, the flexibility is great. You can do any anything. However, doing anything is a nightmare because it's so complicated. Um, and then that's where... Kata comes in. Uh, how many people have heard of Kata? Okay. So the idea of Kata is to um, take all of that flexibility in the sort of second version of the HPA and provide a much more user-friendly interface. So what it comes with is it comes with a catalog of 50 plus uh, built-in scalers. Um, so things like uh, Amazon SQS, Kafka, RabbitMQ. They have a bunch of basically pre-integrated uh, scaling solutions. Um, one of the big things when you're scaling on custom metrics is authentication, because often you need to pull uh, metrics from different platforms. So you might need AWS credentials, Datadog keys, et cetera. They provide built-in options for that. It provides the ability to scale to zero, um, which can be fantastic for certain architectures or dev workloads, et cetera. Um, often, the load can go to basically zero, but you're still left with one or two replicas, and they just sit there eating resources for no reason. So Kata has the ability to scale to zero. We actually use this at Stormforge. We have a task queue, which does a bunch of machine learning tasks. When the queue is empty, the workers go to zero, and we're not paying for the expensive machine learning resources. And then it's extensible. So if you commit to Kata, you still have all the flexibility. You can uh, create your own scaler, and you can still do whatever you like. And you can see on the left here the architecture. Um, so Kata is putting in place um, controllers and metrics adapters, which will um, pull metrics from outside the cluster and get them into the Kubernetes monitoring pipeline. And then what it does is under the hood, it creates a HPA which is configured to work with those metrics. And the HPA handles scaling from one to N, anything greater than zero. And then when you need to scale to zero, Kata will override it and set the replicas to zero directly. So I'm gonna do a demo. Um, it's the first time I've done this demo, so hopefully it goes well. I'm gonna show what it would take to do what Kata does for you on your own. 
and I'm going to make it look very easy, but it took me seven hours yesterday to get right, and it was an absolute nightmare. Okay, so um, let me make this a little bigger. Uh, the use case here is going to be, I stole it, there's a great example app from Kada. It's going to be um, a rabbit MQQ where there's a job which has tasks to the queue and then a consumer which picks them up and does nothing. It just sleeps. And um, let's see. So first, I'm going to install Prometheus. So um, Prometheus is going to store all of the metrics. Uh, um, required to basically monitor the length of the queue, et cetera. If you were scaling on CPU utilization, there would not be no need to install Prometheus um, because Kubernetes handles the whole monitoring pipeline for resource utilization metrics. All right, let's give this a second. Normally this is the slowest part of the demo, so hopefully this is uh, not a bad omen. There we go, perfect. All right, so we have Prometheus installed. Uh, it's in the monitoring namespace. And you can see it installed all of the usual things. There's the Prometheus operator, Grafana, Prometheus itself, the node exporter. We don't need all this, I just didn't want to mess with all the configuration. So next, RabbitMQ. And then we're going to use the Helm chart. This is the first thing which took a bunch of time to try and figure out, getting all of the metrics exposed um, and the service monitors set up so that it will, uh, Prometheus will detect them, ingest the metrics, et cetera. And then if I, can I, is the, is the font big enough? Can everyone see? Yeah, bigger? Bigger. Better? All right, perfect. And then if we go back. There we go. All right, perfect. So we can see that um, it's being scraped, and as expected, there's zero queues in the there's zero messages in the queue. So now let's start um, adding messages to the queue, scaling it up, and see if it scales. And the first, um, so first we're going to deploy the consumer. And then I have um, I have a horizontal pod order scaler, which is set to scale on CPU. So this is the one that everyone starts with, the only thing available in V1, and it's set to scale up at 60%. So we create that, and then we can... Um, Uh, this is a job which will add a lot of tasks to the queue. So if we go back, um, we can see the HPA. And um, I think it's waiting for the pods to come up. There we go. So you can see that the actual CPU utilization, because the task just sleeps when it picks it up, this would be like something which makes a network call and just waits. You may be trying to do a lot of those, but because it produces no utilization, it's a terrible metric to scale on. And if we go back here, you should see a big spike in the queue, in the queue and it's coming down very slowly. Um, so obviously, CPU utilization here makes no sense to scale on. However, um, uh, what would make much more sense is the queue depth. 
So now let's see if we can, um, while it's pulling through those, what it looks like to uh, scale on the Q depth. So the first thing you have to do, we have Prometheus stood up, it's pulling all of the metrics, um, scraping them. We need to find a way to get those out of Prometheus and into the Kubernetes API so they can be used. And the way that's done is using this thing called a Prometheus adapter. And you can see here, um, you have to tell it what the URL for Prometheus is. And then there is this rules format, which took me forever to figure out. And I basically never did. I just managed to hard code the metric names. What this is doing is trying to provide that translation from how the metrics in the other platform, so in this case Prometheus, it could be Datadog, are being labeled, how they are associated with pods and namespaces, and rewrite the whole thing, and then say which one should be regularly scraped and sent to the custom metrics. Okay. So we're gonna install that, and then um, that should provide the plumbing so that it's gonna pull the Q depth from Prometheus, which we just saw in the dashboard. It's gonna put it into the custom metrics API. Um, they have this sheet, which I love, uh, kubectl get dash dash raw. It lets you send requests directly from kubectl, like HTTP requests to the API, so you can debug. Um, and you can see here, uh, it's trying to go to the custom metrics API and see what is available. And while the metric server is, or while the Prometheus adapter is coming up, it doesn't return anything. But if we give it a second, as expected, uh, our Q messages depth is there. Um, and this was another thing which took me forever to get right. Uh, the initial version, the out of the box version, of the Prometheus adapter, the load of the metrics was too high for the API server, so it just rejected everything. So I had to rewrite it to like make it <laughs> a little bit uh, smoother. Um, and then, um, let's see. So we'll delete the old HPA. And then now we can see, so we've plumbed, all of the metrics are in the API. And then you go in and you create a uh, HPA with a custom metric. And here you can see the type of the metric is object. So the reason it's object is because I'm scaling one workload on metrics from another workload. So the consumer workload, the deployment, is being scaled on metrics coming from the rabbit MQ stateful set because that's where the Q depth um, is being tracked. So as I said before, super flexible. It just took a long time to get right. And then if we apply that, um, and then let's go back and look, had it finished with the queue? It almost finished with the queue. I suspect what's gonna happen is this is suddenly gonna start adding replicas. Uh, let's just. Let's rerun the job so we can add more messages. And now you can see that um, the HPA is gonna start scaling up because the ad target queue depth is five per pod. It's 56 right now because we just added way more messages to the queue. Hopefully the number of pods should be going up fairly rapidly. There we go. I don't know why. Oh, yeah, I see it. I see it. Replicas uh, eight on the side. So you can see, as expected, uh, Q depth goes up. All of the plumbing works. The workload scales out. Oh, and yeah, you can see it really processed the queue so much faster. When there was a single replica scaling on the wrong metric, it took a long time to come down. This one emptied in seconds. So yesterday, that took me about six hours to get right. Um, now I'll show you what it takes to do it with Kdoc. So first you have to install Kdoc, simple Helm install. And then the whole point of Kdoc is that it just comes with all of these, all of this plumbing is just done for you. There's no adapter, there's no anything. It just puts the metric where it needs them and it's all basically pre-integrated. And then all I'm gonna have to work with is I'll set up the authentication to the queue and I'll set up the, um, the, they call it a scaled object, that's their wrapper for the HPA. So if I apply this, it 
it should create both. And as I said before, um, Cater is just a wrapper for the HPA. So it's still going to create a HPA under the hood, which does the actual scaling. It's just handling all of the configuration of that for you. So if you go in, you can see a HPA was created. You can see the owner references. It's owned by Cater, that scaled object we just created. And it's created a HPA with the, an external metric, the metric name, the labels are all set up so it matches, et cetera. And then if I... Um, Create the job again. We should see it do it exactly what it did before. So it's going to scale up and it should start adding more replicas. There we go. So you can see it's adding replicas. So something which took Hours yesterday, a helm install, and everything pre-integrated out of the box. I never need to know any of the internals. It just worked. It was fantastic. So highly, highly recommend Kato. And CPU utilization may work to start with, but I think what you'll find is if you keep pushing it in production, it just isn't proportional to the load in a way which is reliable. So you will always be having the wrong number of replicas, thrashing, etc. cetera. Um, all right, so that's horizontal. How am I doing on time? A little tighter on time. Um, so horizontal, adding replicas. Eventually, you need to start thinking about cluster order scaling. Um, and cluster order scaling is about, OK, I've added pods. Eventually, my nodes can no longer fit those pods. How do I add a new node? There's the original tool in this space was the cluster order scaler. And the way the cluster order scaler works is it constantly watches for pending pods, pods which are unschedulable. There isn't enough capacity, and it's like, okay, that's my signal to add capacity. And then it will, this is all in AWS language, it will talk to the order scaling groups, which you have to configure to run in that cluster, and then one of those order scaling groups will start up a new node. Um, the downsides, if you want to use a wide variety of instance types or isolate batch jobs on one order scaling group, et cetera, the overhead can become extremely painful because you have to create um, order scaling groups for all of these. And then controlling the logic to say which pod triggers which order scaling group can be tricky. Um, it can also be slow just because there's that extra hop of order scaling group EC2 API and then it has to trickle back. Um, so that's how it's adding nodes. And then eventually the load drops, you have fragmented nodes, and it has a simple calculation. You set a scale down threshold. Once the capacity on that node or the allocated um, resources on that node drops below the threshold, it'll say, okay, that node is too empty. I'm going to uh, get rid of it. So you can see here it would be this one and this one. And then I'm going to reschedule those workloads somewhere else, which will... In reduce, improve the bin packing, reduce the waste. And you have lots of flexibility to configure the cluster order scaler. You can also hard code labels and annotations on nodes so that they don't get uh, consolidated. Um, lots of flexibility. And what you can see here is, as you would expect, shut down the underutilized nodes, reassign the workloads, bin packing goes up, efficiency goes up. So it works, and, but it has a whole bunch of drawbacks which is why AWS released a new open source project uh, two, three years ago to basically address a lot of those problems. We work with Carpenter with our customers all the time. We use it ourselves internally. It's amazing. Um, however, I'm going to say almost nothing about it because Herbert is talking about it in way more detail, I think in about half an hour in the same room. So you have um, horizontal scaling, uh, the HPA and CADA. You have cluster scaling. Carpenter's amazing, fast, reliable. Um, it can work well with spot instances. Incredible, an incredible tool. However, both the cluster order scaler and Carpenter are both keying off the same signal to um, spin up nodes and remove them. And that's what the size of the actual pods are, which is, as Rafa talked about earlier, requests and limits. How much is the workload saying each replica needs to the Kubernetes API. Does it need uh, one core, half a core, one gigabyte, two gigabytes, et cetera? And if you don't get the requests and limits right, 
it doesn't matter how well you solve the other dimensions, you'll just be propagating the waste from lots and lots of underutilized pods throughout your cluster. And the dirty secret of Kubernetes is no one gets it right. So Datadog did a survey. 50% um, uh, of containers use 25 less than 25% of their resources, which means for every dollar you spend in the cloud, 75% is just pure waste. Um, and the other containers, the other half, there is likely to be under-provisioned and a reliability risk as they are to be appropriately provisioned. And you saw this slide with Rafa. The reason people end up in this state is because there's not really a good way to do it. You have to set requests and limits because otherwise it's too risky, you're gonna go down. Um, if you try and set a one-size-fits-all approach, then it just doesn't work because the diversity of workload types, et cetera, um, this is how you end up. I was joke. People will start t-shirt sizing, small, medium, and large. Then they ask their developers what size they need, and every developer says extra large, which is how they end up with massive over-provisioning. And then eventually it becomes too wasteful, um, and then you try and do it manually, and you realize that providing the tooling, the education, to get developers to try and do this for hundreds, thousands of workloads, it's going to burn more engineering time and money and frustration than it will actually um, save you in cloud costs. So no one really has an answer to this, um, which is, no one has a manual answer to this. And there is a tool to automate this problem built into Kubernetes, the vertical pod autoscaler, the VPA. Um, unlike the HPA and the cluster autoscaler, it's never really got a lot of adoption. Um, the same Datadog survey found that 60, 70% of people were using the HPA. 1% of people were using the VPA. It's basically never really been seriously used in production. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. One is that it has a tendency to fight the HPA because they're both looking at CPU utilization. Uh, the way it rolls out changes are a little problematic because um, it evicts the pods, which can cause disruption. If you have two replicas and you evict a pod, you lose half your capacity at what could be a terrible time to lose it. If you have one replica, you are just down until the pod comes back up. Um, and it has a wide variety of other quirks about configuration, which makes it hard, et cetera. So the VPA isn't really a sort of great solution. Um, Stormforge, my company, we sort of step in, provide the exact same functionality as the VPA, um, just with a lot of the uh, kinks worked out. We're compatible with the HPA, easy to configure. We're a little bit more careful about how we roll out patches. Um, there's less overhead to run all the metric servers, et cetera, for the VPA. Um, and you can basically just forget about the problem. Install and uh, let uh, machine learning set the requests and limits way better than your developers ever did to begin with. Um, I think that's time, almost perfect. Um, uh, please, please click the QR code, mostly because Rafa stole my joke that we had a competition and he got five and I want more than five. <laughs> Um, and come find us in the break or at the happy hour if you want to chat about any of the tools, Kata, Carpenter, our tool, requests and limits, anything. We're around. <laughs>